Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be discovering what's next for data and technology. My name is Chaminda Ranasinghe. I'm the Chief Experience Officer at RMIT University. Now, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Bunwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of our university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely, I want to pay my respect to the wider unceded lands of this nation. Today, the listeners who have joined us, so thank you for joining us. You have the opportunity to submit questions to our speakers uh, by entering them into the question panel on the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to send these in at any time during the event and we'll, we'll try and address them at the end. I'm conscious that we have got some fantastic questions and answers already sort of thought, thought about, but We'd love to hear from you and get your questions throughout the, the webinar. Recorded and will be sent out via email with the slides after the event. So there's no need for you to uh, rush and take lots of notes as we go through. So once again, thank you for joining us. It is an exciting topic. Uh, you know, what's next in data and technology in any industries is becoming the probably the most important conversation many have. In fact, quite interestingly that I was just uh, looking at some numbers that uh, I had seen through some internal literature. Um, we have 40 trillion gigabytes of data in 2020. I didn't even know that there was a term called 40 zettabytes. Uh, so Andrew, James and the team can tell me otherwise, but it's just incredible. But the scary thing for me is 90% of that data was just created in the last two years. Now, before joining the university, I used to work for a bank here in Melbourne ANZ, before that in the UK for an insurance company and before that others like the automotive sector. So I've worked in a number of different organizations and the one common factor when I speak to any of my old colleagues or any of our industry partners that I currently deal with is the one and simple scenario that data fuels their business, fuels their organization, fuels the experiences that they deliver for their customers, their staff, all of their partners, all of their audiences. So it is literally the lifeblood of the organizations that we all work within and that's the criticality of it. Now the reality is we just need to think about given I spoke about the amount of data, the criticality of this is how do we harness the power of that data for your organization to make sure that you deliver the best possible experience for your audiences. Now today to talk about this we are I am absolutely privileged to be joined by leaders from both the public and private sector working at the nexus, I believe, of education and technology. I'll introduce our guests in a second, but importantly, the conversation is something that is live in every uh, industry. I know that that's something that is uh, on everyone's lips at the moment. So for the first guest speaker today is Natalie Trong. Natalie studied an executive MBA at RMIT, and ever since we have watched uh, with admiration, Natalie's progress. And uh, Natalie, over to you to talk a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Chaminda, and thank you, RMIT, for having me here today. Uh, and of course, welcome to all of you, uh, wherever you are joining us from. I hope you are safe and well. Uh, just a little bit about me. So I've got experience across B2B and B2C uh, in organisations uh, similar to Chaminda, actually. I worked at the ANZ Bank. Uh, I was also a Bank of Melbourne for Westpac, IOOF, and now I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Asia um, at Mercer. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, next, we have the Executive Director of the Institute of Data, uh, and which is something that I'm excited about because we partner very closely with the Institute of Data. So Andrew Campbell. Andrew, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Shaminda. Great to be here. Um, yeah, uh, my career, I suppose, is um, gone from uh, sales and marketing, where I used to work at uh, APN News and Media and Optus um, in the early part of my career. Then I started to, uh, well, then I, then I started founding my own businesses, uh, built a couple of technology businesses, and most recently founded the Institute of Data, which has um, uh, gone on to become a pretty large professional network in the, uh, uh, in the data industry. So I've really seen the transformation from, of business 
towards technology and then from technology towards data. Um, yeah, it's a really exciting space to be in. Thank you, Andrew. And finally, I'm delighted to introduce one of our own and someone from one of my favourite schools of the university. Yes, James, I do geek out. Um, so James Harlan, who is our Associate Dean of Student Experience and the Professor of Computational Logic at RMIT. James. Thank you, Chami, and geek to geek, thank you very much. Yeah. Look, I think um, I've been a staff member at RMIT in computer science for more years than I care to make specific in public, but long enough to have seen a lot of trends over that time from back when I started, when if you could program, there was one thing called computer science and you just learned to program and that was it. Now there's a, a range of skills needed, a range of different professions and a lot of different uh, skill sets that are needed within that. So I think one of the really exciting things about this particular time is that we're seeing, if you like, a second generation of technologists where we've had the computing boom, if you like, and now we're getting much into the rise of data. And I think that's something that's been quite exciting to view over the perspective for the number of time I've been at RMIT. Thanks, James. So again, thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm delighted to have you on board. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So let's dive in. Let's get into it. Um, the first question, Andrew, is for you. Now, this is something I spoke about earlier. We are faced with so much of data. It's overwhelming. So the question is, how do you analyze and understand it? Where the hell do you start? Yeah, it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, I think my approach is two prongs. You want to take um, you want to take a technology based approach because with the volume and um, the, the sheer quantity of data that's out there, you can't analyze it on a spreadsheet anymore. So you do need to use technology in order to understand it. And that's where AI and machine learning comes in. So you need those skills um, or the capacity and capability within your organization for people to do that. But you also need to take a common sense approach. So you've got to, whenever you have a challenge that involves data, people around you have inherently got their own assumptions. People are making arguments. We should go ahead and do this and drawing conclusions. So you need to use a bit of common sense and critical thinking, ask questions of not just the people around you, but also the data. And, uh, and so um, in that way, through that two pronged approach, using technology and using um, using some common sense interpersonal skills. Um, in a nutshell, that's how I'd say I approach it. Common sense, wow, simple. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, leading from that question, Natalie, in your role at Mercer, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about the data that you work with uh, and how you have learned the skills to find the trends in that data uh, to make it valuable and that real the, how the real data contributes to your business uh, and probably to the, the experience of your customers and then what you need from the data scientists that either you have within your organization or you partner with. Thanks, Chaminda. Uh, I want to start by saying I'm no data geek. <laughs> So I'm not, I don't know how many trillions of pieces of data is out there, but that's amazing and it's really fascinating. Um, what I love about data is the ability for us to see what the trends will be. So Mercer being who we are, I mean, we are one part of our business. I mean, we have a breadth of, um, in terms of the business we work with, but one part of our business is all about data. I can tell you anything from what you should be paying an executive or an employee across 100 countries, versus what the medical inflation trends will be in 43 other countries, et cetera. So we have a lot of data, but I think uh, where uh, what I've loved about working at Mercer and, and using that data is what are the trends? How do we help clients um, work out what their employee benefits should be for the next two years, et cetera? How do we help clients who want to send um, employees to different parts of the world ensure that they're being paid um, equitably um, across different parts so that you don't have one CEO sitting in Asia and another CEO sitting in the US being paid completely different um, remuneration. So I love that piece about data um, and then the trends that we can see around. Uh, we do a lot of work around investment trends, so uh, working out the, the global pension index, working out um, how the data, uh, the data we use to, to work out which indexes or which pension systems around the world are doing well and which need need work in. 
In terms of what I need from a marketing perspective or a brand perspective, we use data to make sure that we're sending you the right message at the right time. Um, and we use data to make sure that we're not spamming you. We use data to make sure that the experience you have is a great experience with us. Um, we use data to make sure that you get the right invoices and you build the right amount of money. So we use data for a whole bunch of things. But what I find um, in terms of my data people at the moment, I have great people that can extract millions of bits of data for me. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. Recently, I asked one of my data people for the top 25 clients in a particular market. Uh, and I explained to this person that I wanted to use it for marketing campaigns. He is exceptional, this data person that I have. He heard the first part and got super excited about getting me the top 25 clients in that market, but forgot about the second part because what he, the report that I got from him, I did get the top 25 by revenue, but then I said to him, where's the rest of the information? He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, how am I going to market? Because I only know the revenue. I don't know what products or services they've bought from us. I don't know who the contacts are. I don't know how long ago they bought from us and if they've had any other experiences. So um, what, what I'd like to say, Chaminda, is for data people, that's great that you can extract the data, but always learn to ask the right questions as well, the relevant questions uh, for the business that you're, you're pulling that data for. Thanks, Chaminda. Thank you. That's a lovely insight. I mean, the, the the need for you for the data people to put themselves in their customers' shoes. They're, they're, that's so important so they understand the full picture. Thank you. Uh, the next question is actually for all of you. So in your experience, um, how are universities changing? I mean, the approach that we have to take in the way that we teach, um, the interpersonal skills that we've spoken about, that full picture, understanding the macro environment, um, and ensuring that our students are prepared for the ever changing, I mean, the rapid change of technology advancement, that is so critical. So why don't I start with you, Andrew? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the um, I think universities are changing dramatically at the moment, um, and it's a great thing. And I, RMIT is clearly leading that, um, that change in that direction as well. The partnership that RMIT and the Institute of Data has um, is kind of showcasing this um, this new way of learning. So with the uh, with the data science and AI bootcamp that we offer together, students can do a three month full time or a six month part time program, and then get straight into a job after that. And then once you've got that job, start accumulating experience on the job, and but continue on to complete a master's. So that's a monumental shift in the way that people um, undertake education rather than um, the old days, which was like six months ago, uh, where you would start studying and keep studying for year after year after year and then struggle to get a job at the end of it. Now it's much faster and it needs to be to keep pace with technological change. So in the program that we teach folks as well, there's innovation. We've got this really strong focus on interpersonal skills, how to ask questions, how to do critical thinking well. Documentation, which often gets forgotten about, it's so important to write good quality documents within an organisational context. Um, and presentation skills, if you need to present your findings to your boss or a group of stakeholders, having the ability to um, quickly convey complex concepts um, is, is just so important. So we teach storytelling and presentation skills uh, and all of that. And that gets done in a practical, skills-focused, intensive three-month or six-month program. And then, um, and then we just focus on getting you in a, to a job with one of our industry partners. Thank you, Andrew. Some great insights there. Natalie, can I come to you next, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I wish I was still at university, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, I had a great experience when I did my executive M MBA probably six years ago. Um, and then recently, so uh, this year in February, I also went and did a course at the Harvard Business School. So absolutely enjoyed that. And, and both experiences have been tremendous. But the university, the way in which you're teaching, not just the technical aspects, the things that Andrew talked about are so critical. When I'm looking at hiring 
um, data people. Yes, it's great that they've got the technical skills, but that's just, you know, that's part and part. That's your seat at the table to, to have a chat. I, I do look at that, but it's your interpersonal skills, it's your communication skills, it's your ability to, to sell yourself um, and, and to talk to me about how you would critically think about um, problems as opposed to just, you know, I've got the highest accreditation or anything like that. I, I, I look at an all rounder as opposed to just the, the technical aspects, Chaminda. Thank you, Natalie, and it's, I think it resonates with exactly what Andrew said as well. James, being from the university, I'll come to you last. No drama, Chaminda. Look, I think universities are probably changing slowly than we would like, but I think COVID has certainly accelerated a lot of the changes we're seeing. I think most universities do have some kind of project or context-based learning where students learn communication interpersonal skills by working on some small but realistic project with a group of four or five others to produce an outcome that's uh, perhaps scaffolded, but as realistic as we can generally make it. I think that's something that's been going on for a long time and is certainly becoming more and more mainstream. But I think we're slowly starting to see a lot more radical moves in that. For example, in our computing degree, we're starting starting next year going to have some boot camps where you start for the first four weeks getting some programming skills, launching into that fundamental skill to that you can use so we can then leverage that across um, some longer uh, term projects you use. So Lewis is trying to break down the traditional academic structures of having four courses taught in parallel over a, a 12 week semester into something that's more akin to where would the educational outcomes be best optimised by using that time of that 12 weeks or so rather than a traditional structure. I think the other thing that Andrew alluded to and I think is critical as well is a three way partnership between students, academia and industry, which exists in all marketing brochures for all universities in some form. But making that a lot more genuine, a three way partnership, having industry in the classroom exposed to the students from the get go, from the very start. So rather than wait till a capstone year or perhaps a final semester project to get industry involvement, we have them in there right from the beginning. So, for example, we'd mentioned this boot camp model to some of our industry advisory committee and one of them put a hand to say, can I come and be an instructor? We say that sounds great. That'd be fantastic. So that way we get this three way partnership integrated from the very beginning rather than as an add on towards the end. Fantastic, great insights. I mean, that scenario that you need to be an all rounder and you have to make it you know, almost snackable, pick up things when you need to and then maybe have a main meal afterwards. That's fantastic. The connection to industry, being hands on, fantastic insights. Uh, thank you. Andrew and Jess, let me come to you next. We've spoken about the fact that there's no issue around getting data. There's plenty of data. The challenge is how do we understand it? So let's turn to AI and machine learning. And how do we use that technology to better understand data? And on the flip side of that, what does data contribute to helping us develop those sorts of technologies? Yeah, good question. It is an iterative process, um, Shuminda, and I think the most, what we teach people in the program is to start with a business problem and preferably uh, preferably one that's quantifiable in dollar terms. So, and it's not that complicated. Um, business problems can fall under only a small number of categories. There's revenue, there's costs, uh, there's profit. Um, and then you've got um, the efficiency of assets and inventory management, and those types of ideas. They're not complex ideas, but it is really important for data professionals to understand them and start there, start with a business problem and then turn it into a data problem. Once you've got, once you've made that step, then you can start to perform exploratory data analysis and start to pick up some directions to go with, to go in. And then, and then the next step is to um, define the problem and then design a solution and deliver it. So when it comes to uh, designing an AI or machine learning solution, there's a, there's a whole host of different models that you can choose from and you can test them out and then you can run an ensemble method across all of them as well and see see if you can get an even better outcome from doing that. Uh, and then you you often along this journey, you often make mistakes and fail, um, but you kind of generate insight and learn things as you go. And at the end of the day, you should be able to turn the insights that you get from the data back into a solution that addresses the uh, the commercial challenge that you started out trying to address. Um, 
I think uh, uh, we had a we had one of our industry partners, a consulting firm, um, speaking at an event the other day, and and he said that their threshold for um, business problems is five hundred thousand dollars. So are you going to is it because otherwise it's just not worth doing a little bit of work. So you want to be solving a problem that's at least worth five hundred thousand dollars before everybody gets out of bed in the morning. That's great insights. Thank you, Andrew. James, can I come to you next, please? Sure, thanks, Tammy. Look, I think to some extent the answer to this question is bound up in your opening statement about the amount of data we have. 40 bazillion, thousand gazillion, whatever it was. The problem is a lot of the scale is just beyond human comprehension. And you know, we can count up to a thousand maybe if you're really patient. And um, 500,000 as a minimum, that's already a huge number. So I think part of the answer to the question is how do we use AI and machine learning? How do we use technology to do the analysis we simply cannot do by hand or with human skill? It takes networks of machines of very powerful um, configurations in order to even begin to understand the data we already have, let alone what we'll have in, what was it, two more years? We'll have another, whatever the hell it was again, amount of data again. So if you like, without AI and machine learning, we are lost. We are, it'd be like swimming in an ocean. Yes, maybe you can swim a short distance, but you're not gonna swim from one side of the Pacific to the other, let alone around the globe several times, which is the kind of scale of data we have. So to even begin to cope with scale, we have to use technology and AI and machine learning are probably the cutting edge of that technology that we need to be able to do, even have some sort of a prayer of analyzing a small fraction of the data we have. I think the other part of the question is also quite interesting. What role does data play to contributing those technologies? I go back a few years, probably 10 years ago, and the whole uh, view of AI was very different. It was kind of an esoteric and nerdy, geeky thing stuck in universities, a handful of companies, but wasn't really mainstream. What's made it mainstream now is the availability of a lot of data to do those sort of problems, but also a critical part was um, AlphaGo, which was the, the Google uh, machine that learned how to play Go. That used more data than any human could uh, can, can generate by playing games of Go in several lifetimes. So just the availability of data was then able to say these to be blunt, fairly old algorithms. A lot of the machine learning and AI techniques have their origins of maybe 30, 40 years ago, but it's only now we're actually able to apply them at scale because of the advance of technology that we're able to do that. So I think having the data and access to it actually enables and enhances these technologies to try out things we couldn't do before. So it's very much synergistic, but I think it also perhaps the, the way to underlie it all is to say, it's all about technology because without the technology, we are nowhere. We don't even have any vague idea of how to cope with the data we have. And so the, the two have a very synergistic um, relationship between data, technology and AI and machine learning. They're all part of the same parcel to some extent. James, let me stick with you for the next question then given, on, given the conversation we've just had. You know, sometimes James, I wish I could go back and tell my first year uni self to stick with stats 101 you know the the amount of people that are, we are so desperate for data scientists and people who are data literate uh, it's becoming you know one of the toughest challenges that we all face so in the context of that as the discipline of data science evolves what are the different kinds of data science that we're going to need uh, as the world evolves excellent question chami i wish i could say we have 2020 hindsight but i think there's a number of different areas where this will evolve just as the uh, evolution of engineering or computing has evolved into different disciplines. I think there's a number of different areas we might, but a few that I can foresee is probably what we might call confirmatory analysis. So we get something like, I think there were more frosts when I was a kid. Well, presumably we've got the data to go back and check which mornings had frost and have common or frequent occurrence that was compared to now. That's what you might call confirmatory analysis. I think there's also a need for people who might be more exploratory. Some of the things Andrew was picking up on earlier about that's where the AI comes in to some extent. How do we find things in the data that we weren't looking for? And there's some classic examples of that about correlations between people who bought beer also bought nappies of all things. That was an unexpected result. I know Andrew can tell you a story about the most frequently bought item at a supermarket. That's somewhat surprising as well. But that sort of discovery aspect, what does the data tell us that we perhaps didn't expect? A third area, I think, and this is probably the one where the machine learning is most useful, is prediction. We all know about various uh, potential disasters we're facing, bushfires, pandemics, climate change, rising sea temperatures, whatever it might be. 
But a lot of that is about prediction. Say, what sort of world are my children and grandchildren going to have? Are they going to find that the sea levels have risen several metres? Or are there ways that we can control things? That's all about predictive analysis, about extrapolating from the current data we have. And that becomes a much more uh, difficult game because it involves rather than looking back and saying, we know what happened back in 2010 or 2000, it's looking forward. What is going to happen in 2030 or 2040? Personally, I'm in doubt what's going to happen next week. So having any sort of future prediction is obviously filled with danger, but we have to some extent do the best we can. So it's a different kind of analysis we need there. Thanks, James. I wish Dan could answer all of our questions, but I know there's some <laughs> limitations. Uh, Natalie, let me come back to you. This is something that's obviously quite close to my heart and my marketing team. How do you use data to tell your marketing or your brand story to your business and your customers and your stakeholders? Thanks, Chiminda. I will answer that, but just uh, to pick up on what James and Andrew just spoke about, if you don't mind, just take a couple of um, minutes on that. Um, for those of you sitting out there listening, and if uh, it's a little bit overwhelming uh, and you don't feel like you need all the tech speak or all the data speak, uh, I just want to say one thing to you all. Like I, I think what Andrew, the course that Andrew talked about, and we've spoken about this a while ago, is fantastic because it teaches you the technical and the soft skills. Um, so I'm not saying it's an it's a not, but if you're sitting there going, I don't really uh, need to know all this or this is way too much, it's okay just to have um, some of the basics and to go pick a course that, that develops some of those basics for you. Because I'm I'm going to tell you right now, it's not the person that has the best technology or the best data geek that is going to win in the end. It is the person that best understands what data is most important to their business or to their stakeholders. So you don't need to be the best data geek. Uh, so uh, just on that point, uh, to answer your question, Chiminda, we, um, uh, I have a really simple approach to data when it comes to our business and then how we communicate that to the business. Uh, as marketers, we have data and we have um, measurements for a ton of stuff. We can measure everything. Um, and, and we try and, you know, sometimes we actually overwhelm the business with how much we can measure share a voice, uh, marketing generated, marketing engaged, marketing, you know, sales funnels, ATFOs, you name it. We've got every acronym that you can think of. Uh, so what I talk to the business about in terms of our ROI for marketing is three simple things. The business only really thinks about revenue, um, sales, sorry, expenses, and then profit. And so I've done the same from a marketing uh, perspective, Chiminda. We talk about how many sales accepted leads come through. Um, we don't talk about marketing leads. We talk about how many did the sales team say, yes, we'll take those. How many did they convert where they won? And then how much revenue did they generate from it? So in our business, we don't talk about any other marketing metrics or data or, or, or um, points of references. We just stick to those three to try and help the business understand uh, the value that, that we drive. That's great, Natalie. It gives a clear focus. It's fantastic. Um, look, lastly, before I open to the, the questions that we received from our audience, uh, let me open this up to all of you. Uh, in a few sentences, what transformations are you most excited about uh, in the world of data? And I'm conscious now that you're right. It's not just about the data aspect of it but in the context of the overall usage, behavior, acceptance, um, you know, when it comes to understanding data, over to any of you. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think, well, firstly, bananas. Um, in answer to James's uh, <laughs> segue before, bananas are, it turns out, are the most commonly purchased um, item by frequency. Um, and yeah, that was, that was found, that was discovered by May Ann um, in, in her capstone project. Um, May Ann did this capstone project on um, predicting a customer's basket order from what they've previously purchased on an e commerce platform. Um, May Ann's gone on to work at the, um, the Australian Tax Office as a data scientist there. So she's busily helping us all pay less tax, I hope. <laughs> but um, she was an interesting one because May Ann's really technical and really smart. But it actually took her a little bit longer than some of the other folks in the course to, to get into a job. Um, a lot of the people with the stronger interpersonal skills actually get jobs faster. So what um, Natalie's saying is absolutely correct. I'm fascinated by the way that 
this um, change is impacting business across all functions. So every type of business in every type of industry and every function is being transformed by this. So um, that's my answer, Jamie. Thank you. Um, unless Andrew and James, sorry, James and Natalie, if you have anything to add, I might uh, open up to other questions. James, you go. I'd just like to add, Andrew, I think one of the things that also excites me as a geek is the ability to link data in real time. So for example, we could take the banana example and say, okay, now that I know that, do I go and look at the price of bananas? Do I see if there's a shortage or a surplus of bananas? Should I be investing in banana farms or I should be selling off that stock because there's too many of them? I think that's the sort of thing we can do in this sort of um, environment now, rather than make take several weeks to do that. I might have a portfolio of banana companies by the time this talk finishes if I wanted to. That's the kind of thing I'm excited about. It's the speed and way we can link data together to do things we could never dream about previously. Thank you. Um, thank you for all of those fantastic insights. So now we've got some great questions here from the audience. Some we've touched on, maybe we can go deeper as I ask the questions. Natalie, I'll come to you for this one because you spoke about um, organisations focusing on revenue and profitability and having a single view. Uh, for an entire organisation rather than having disparate measures of success for different parts of the team. So that was a, a great insight. The question here is, can you link the use of data by an organisation to profitability? Uh, yeah, you can. Um, absolutely. Uh, we do profitability studies all the time throughout MESA. So we do it on clients, we do it on segments, we do it on business uh, to determine whether or not you know, we should be in one business or another. We should be focusing on different industries. Uh, so absolutely, yes, I do believe you can. Um, and, and the simplistic view that I gave you around the marketing metrics or, or the way the business measures is just so that um, if marketers are out there listening, I want them to remember that we don't need to, we can have as marketers 15 metrics, but the business is not interested in the 15 metrics because the business thinks about revenue, expenses and profit. Therefore, like I said before, it's not the person with all the best data or the best technology or the best marketing campaigns. It's actually the person that best understands what is important to the business is, re is really the point I was trying to make about that simplistic view. That's brilliant, Natalie, couldn't agree more. Um, now, we've already spoken about data overload and having too much of it. I think Andrew answered that beautifully. Judge, let me come to you as an extension of that. Any tips from your point of view to get actionable insights given the overload of data? I think it comes down to what Andrew said about common sense. You've also got to think about things like veracity and sources of data. Just because data's out there doesn't mean it's necessarily trustworthy. There's what could be fake news, if you like. It's also a matter of different data sources may have a higher level of credibility due to the provenance or the, the frequency of refreshment or the, the sources of data they use. So I think part of it does come back to a human call at the end. If you like, there's only so much technology can do for you. It might give you all kinds of different um, aspects or insights into data. But at the end of the day, a human's got to make a decision and say, you know, actually, I think weighing up all the factors, uh, Team A is going to win the footy match tomorrow. That's a human call. And it might just be, you know, based on gut instinct, given there's no conclusion from the, the AI sources you have. I think that's really got to be the, the part of it. Picking up what Natalie's saying, it's not just about the best geeks or the best techniques. There's got to be a, a human element or a common sense or a, a sort of some kind of human level reasoning involved. Great. Um, and again, I might just move to Andrew for this one. We've touched on this again, Andrew, around the skill sets required to use technologies. But the question here is what are the top three technologies available to harness the data? Again, it's, it's a fairly broad question. There could be so many different technologies, but in your mind, what are the top two or three things that uh, technologies that are out there that you should think um, you know, our audience might be interested in listening to or hearing about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Python and SQL would be the, the, the go-to um, the go-to um, tools and technologies right now. Um, the other the other language that's used in the industry is R. Um, but it's not used as much as Python and Python is more versatile and contains a whole lot of really great libraries that you can use specifically designed for um, for AI and machine learning. 
Um, and then there's stuff like cloud technology as well, which is really useful. Being able to spin up an instance in AWS and um, and deploy into the cloud. So the, those sort of machine learning engineering skills are really quite useful. Um, and and I guess it's being able to just know where to start and just so that's what we teach you in the course is the um, it's not that hard. We give you a process to go through, teach you how to do basic Python, give you those foundational skills. The other skill you need is the basic maths and stats. So you pick up those and with that with that sort of skill set, you can um, you can deploy um, technology in this area pretty rapidly. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Natalie, this one specifically for you actually. Um, the question is, you mentioned that asking the right questions is also important, along with the ability to extract the data, which is obviously the, the, the value that I think all of you have spoken about. How would you test the mindset of a data scientist, data analyst, when you're hiring them? So how would you test for those skills? Wow, that's a great question. Great. <laughs> I'm going to give away some of my trade secrets <laughs> then. <laughs> um, I, I, it's actually quite a generic test, and I'm not actually that fussed about the answer. I'm actually more interested in the questions that they'll ask me in order to get to an answer. So there's a ton of um, tests you can uh, Google. So one of the ones we have is how many pianos in Chicago? Uh, you may know of that one. Yeah, it's I, I use that a lot and I don't actually care what the answer is. A lot of the times I can tell straight away whether or not the geek and I don't mean that in a, in a terrible <laughs> way to anyone because I'm hiring data geeks. I mean, I need them for that, uh, but I'm, I'm not actually that fussed about the answer. I want to know I listen to how they ask the questions to get to that response. So it's not actually, can you get the answer right? It's what questions are you asking me in order to get to the answer? And then the final thing that helps me also is, you know, at the end of interviews, people always say, Chiminda, so do you have any questions for me? And a lot of the times, whether it's a cultural thing or whether it's they're straight out of union, they're a bit nervous or whether they're geeks or, or whether they generally don't have any questions. It's the ones that don't have any questions for me that I sit back and I think, then this role is probably not right for you. I'm naturally curious. We have a business that is always curious about how we can do things better. And so I'm interested in questions that you have at the end. Um, and sometimes I mix it up, Chiminda. Sometimes I actually ask them two questions in the interview and then I just go, do you have anything for me? And then I get, it's just a chat, you know, they're expecting to be, you know, getting questions fired at them. Um, but I mix it up just to see how they respond to the different pressures. So great. yeah, I hope that answers that. I hope that helps. <laughs> I think they're great tips. I've certainly taken some notes. Related to your point about geeks, I certainly don't think a geek is a bad thing these days. I certainly uh, think that the, the terminology is probably misrepresented back in the day, but um, in that same way, we've got a question here. Uh, in 2015, the Harvard Business Review named data scientists as the sexiest job of the 21st century. <laughs> this is an open question for all three of you. Is this still true? And what is the sexiest aspect of that job in the context of our discussion? Can we start by getting a definition of sexy? <laughs> sexy. So I'm moving on very quickly because that's not going to be between geeks. Sorry, I think Andrew had a response. I'll leave it with Andrew. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I uh, yes, I, so, there's only so many ways you can go on this uh, in this format. But I would say that the sheen has come off a little bit. Because um, back in 2015, everyone was thinking about all of the opportunity, and and it's we, we could all see it, and it's come true. The opportunity is exploding in this sector. But what happened was people hired a bunch of data scientists and expected far too much of them. So a lot of the time, if you've got if you've got a really you got someone that you're bringing out of tech and um, statistics and you put them in an organizational context and you get and you say, all right, now let's make some magic. They're like, what they do is they sit there and they ask you, oh, well, what did you want me to do? And you, and then 
the manager of the data scientist would say back to them, I want you to do your thing, do your data science thing and make us some money. And the guy's like, how do I do that? <laughs> so everything that we're talking about on this forum today, and uh, you're seeing it direct from industry here, is that is the evolution of that. Now what's happening is data scientists are plugging into stakeholders, they're plugging into the business, and they're starting to comprehend how to create commercial value. Um, so I don't think, so I don't know, look, maybe it's still just as sexy as it was in 2015 um, after we got over that little road bump, but there's so much potential for to add value to organisations in this area that um, there's a lot of interesting things to be done. Thank you, Andrew. On a serious note, I mean, it doesn't have to be the role as a data scientist, as, as a as a single entity, I think every most roles today has to have an appreciation of data. So I think these are common skills that people should be thinking about. So thank you for that. Uh, again, open to all of you. Um, what's the most ex or most surprising application of data that you've seen? So maybe just a single answer from all of you. So let's start, start with you, James. The most surprising application of data. It's hard to know what you find surprising, I suppose, but I think a lot of the um, the data around COVID has been quite a surprise just to see how much um, information is out there. So I think one of the surprising aspects here in what was the lockdown capital of the universe until a few weeks ago was the number of donut days. And to me, how how accurate the, the uh, modelling we had turned out to be because they predicted it would be down to a handful by the end of October and they got it almost perfect. So that was quite a surprise to see something as large and complex as that seemed to be, at least in the published data, seemed to be perfectly accurate. That was actually quite a surprise, I think. Yeah, fantastic answer. Andrew, what about yourself? Well, I'm thinking about it and I just keep coming back to the point that James made before about um, the speed at which we can now deploy these technologies. Um, that's probably surprising. Like when I think about it, that, that struck me today actually. So it is amazingly, it is amazing. And I still got, I got surprised today with the immediacy of the technology that we have. And I think um, I think that's a really good point and it's worth reflecting on because and it is the reason that we have zero cases in Victoria, which is isn't that just amazing? <laughs> it's because of that ability to monitor data and also disperse that information in real time out to everyone in the population. So we can all monitor it. We all know what's going on and we can all adapt and change our behaviour because of this data that's there. So, yeah, that's that's it for me. And, and Natalie, yourself? Uh, so just to give a different perspective, I guess, uh, the surprising part, I, I love what James talked about then, so the donut days is fantastic example, but what surprised me, and it, it's been a while, is the personalization, the use of data for personalization, especially from a marketing perspective. When, when it first came out around personalization, you know, I was looking at flowers on one side and all of a sudden every single feed I had was trying to sell me flowers from Facebook to LinkedIn to Twitter. You know, I had flowers for everything. So, so the whole idea of personalization uh, still freaks me out a bit. You know, the other day, uh, um, as an example on Facebook, I saw an ad for um, uh, laser for your skin. And my partner who, you know, has nothing to do with that aspect or nothing to do with laser for her skin or anything like that. We would just started talking about it one day because I said, oh, this is interesting. I've seen this before. And then three days later, her feed on Facebook started showing the same laser clinic. And I was like, <laughs> so, so it does freak me out uh, and surprises me all at the same time, Shaminda. And, and I know we're responsible as I marketers know. for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's me too, Natalie, that, that sort of creepy line. It's just how far do you go over that versus staying well behind it? Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Look, I'm conscious of time. Maybe one last question and let's look. I, I don't think 2020 can uh, be sort of, we can't have a conversation without we're talking about the pandemic. We've touched on it, but let's look at it from a positive viewpoint. What, I mean, take the John Hopkins data, all the daily, the donut data. It's amazing how many people are fascinated and focused on the data, the information that's been presented to them. So in that context, do you believe the pandemic has stimulated the public's interest in data, in the massive ability for data to help us through something like the pandemic? And, and in that context, what's got you excited about the future given what's going on right now? So for any of you, maybe a quick answer. 
Yeah, well, this, um, all of this is now well and truly in the public conscious, right? Ep consciousness. Everyone thinks about this. On Everyone thinks about fake news, the quality of the information that they get, the the AI bubble that they're in on Facebook. And this is all this is all stuff that, that, that everyone thinks about nowadays. So COVID uh, and the year of 2020, the craziness of it all has has absolutely brought um, the world's attention. Like lay people are now thinking about data every single day. Um, so yeah, it's a great time to get into the industry and be a professional in the data industry. <laughs> I think that's probably a great way to close, uh, Andrew. Look, I'm, unfortunately we've run out of time. I, I'm certainly able to talk about this for much longer. I'm sure you can as well. And that's not a geek answer now, because I just think this is <laughs> <laughs> um, So look, for the, for the audience, hopefully you've got something out of that. If there are any questions that we haven't answered and you're still on uh, your mind, please feel free to email it to us. Um, there's an email that we'll showcase, but it's campaigns at rmit.edu. .au and we'll respond as, as soon as we can. I'm sure that the audience here will help me answer any of those going forward. Uh, thank you so much, Natalie, Andrew and James. I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Hope you found it uh, you know, as enjoyable. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening or wherever, whatever time zone you might be. And we'll speak soon, hopefully. Thanks, Thanks Jamina. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, guys.